Uh, but up next with me uh, is transformative transportation. And I'm very thrilled uh, to have this panel uh, being led by Larry Magan. Larry uh, is uh, not only an expert in, in transportation, uh, but really in, in all things technology. He uh, has a, his own company called Connect Safely uh, and uh, will be joining us here on stage. So please join me in welcoming all of them. Larry, sitting in the audience. Yeah, you'll be on. I'll grab the end feet. Right. Hi, how are you? Good. What's your name? Jay. You're Jay. Okay. Great. Well, so we've got a really interesting panel on what I consider to be one of the more interesting uh, fields going forward. In fact, it was talked about in the previous panel how autonomous driving is an enormous incubator of all sorts of technologies and uh, developments. Uh, and of course, autonomous driving is just one of the many aspects of the future of transportation. Uh, of course, there are other aspects of automotive technology, including driver assistance, including electrification. Definitely, uh, tomorrow's car is not your father's Oldsmobile by any stretch of the imagination. But it also, of course, goes beyond the, the automobile. There's uh, transportation innovations going on with scooters, with bicycles, uh, with drone technology. Uh, we are not terribly far away, one presumes, uh, from autonomous uh, aircraft. Uh, it, it certainly, well, we already have autonomous unmanned aircraft, but per perhaps someday there'll be sort of an Uber taxi, air taxi service that's completely self-flying. So there's a lot of interesting stuff coming down the road, no pun intended. Uh, I actually have a particular interest in this subject because I uh, drank the Kool-Aid and finally ordered myself uh, back in November, uh, a Tesla Model 3, uh, partially so that I could learn what it's like to drive what is so far the closest thing to an autonomous car that you can actually buy and own and drive on public highways. And in having now put 5,000 miles on it over the past three months, I have learned a lot about the promise, but I've also learned a lot about the difficulties uh, in trying to create a modern autonomous car, or in, in this case, I would argue semi-autonomous car, driving on the same highways as your old father's Oldsmobile and all the other cars. And I've had many interesting experiences, including some near misses and including some software failures and uh, issues where the roads weren't quite uh, in sync with the software. So it centered itself in the lane, but the lane was really not the lane. And therefore, I was actually not where I was supposed to be and numerous other issues. So I'm very excited to see how our panel can address both the long-term future of transportation, where I think we will someday be in a world where there will be virtually accident-free because every vehicle on the road will be uh, in, sync, in sync and autonomous and um, uh, with lots of technology, but we have a long way to go between now and then. And in the meantime, we are sharing the road between various levels of driver's assistance, ranging from fully autonomous, as in the case of some of the Uber and Waymo vehicles that are starting to go on the road uh, to completely manual, but most cars with some form of driver assistance, whether it's adaptive cruise control or lane centering, or in the case of Tesla, what they jokingly call full self-driving, which of course is not full self-driving, but is at least further along in that direction. So why don't we start with Jay, who's the CEO and co-founder of LM Industries, and I've asked each panel to just speak for about a minute or so uh, to talk a little about what they do, and then We'll follow up with questions, some interaction between the panel, and of course, interaction with the audience. Thanks, Larry. Um, so I'm Jay Rogers, and I started LM Industries uh, back in 2007 with a uh, idea that technology comes into vehicles too slowly. And uh, it's not anybody's fault, it's a system issue. And so we set about building a company that would change the way we make vehicles. So we are a digital OEM, and that means that effectively our vehicles are planned in a digital space, they are built in a digital space, they are deployed, harvested, and then uh, upgraded as such. Um, there are many analog things about a vehicle. Um, and I joke that you can't re reinvent the wheel, and that is true. Uh, but what I do think is important is looking at the way in which our systems come together to be at a safety indicator level that is one that you can rely on for a robot, 
When I started the company, we were thinking about technology that wasn't anywhere near self-driving vehicles. And so um, today, we 3D print a vehicle in nine hours. Um, that party trick is not because we can, it's because tooling cost is the biggest impediment to changing up technology in vehicles. So we design a vehicle, designed for additive manufacturing, hit a button, the print is done nine hours later, the vehicle is assembled in less than 100 man hours, and out the door it goes. Uh, it could be autonomous or it could be electric, but our take on these things is that to change the rate of adoption, we need to change the way we build vehicles. So our current major product is Ali. It's a self-driving shuttle, and it is um, in five markets, eight cities around the world in operations. The closest to here is in Sacramento. Uh, it is a level four vehicle. It uh, has no steering wheel. It does have a steward. Um, and if uh, regulation were more advanced, it could be operating in level five scenarios. Um, it is a low speed self-driving vehicle, though it can go high speed. We operate it because of the layout of passengers and because of the build of the vehicle at below 20 miles an hour, uh, which feels really fast when you are unbelted and sitting in a vehicle. And so uh, that's what we do and how we came about doing it. Pleased to be here. Very, very glad to hear. So I'm curious when you say, print, you know, basically self-printed in nine hours, I take it what that means you just have a bunch of parts lying around at that point, and that's where the 100 man hours comes in to actually putting it together? Correct. So Lego is well known to probably everyone in this room, and mm -hmm. the nice thing about a, a plastic injected molded part that's well designed is that it actually does click together when you want it to go. Um, the nature of building a numerically controlled printed vehicle is uh, you can design for the net shape, and then when it comes time to put in the battery and the motor and the glass, if they are cut or built in the net shape, then they put together. And is this something we'll be able to do at home someday soon? <laughs> no. no. But it is the kind of thing where disassembly and reassembly, um, we do like the idea of hardware upgrades. And um, our target for assembly of the vehicle is under five man hours. Well, it's interesting you mentioned hardware upgrades because one of the things that really interests me, so I drive a car where there are software upgrades continuously. Sure. But I'm wondering whether I'll ever be able to, for example, upgrade my battery because I, my battery sure. only goes for 260 miles. I think in about five years it's going to be, be a battery that goes 500 miles. You know, and of course we don't. You don't. None of us. No one besides Elon Musk even has a clue whether the answer is yes or no. But that is one of the things I wonder because one of the beauties of personal computers, at least historical, historically, was the ability to upgrade them and whether that will be true with vehicles going forward. This is a business model question, not a technology question. Right. Tesla built a consumer car, and so they have built a car, which is, there is a great blog of a guy who upgraded his non-dual motor scenario to a dual motor scenario, and it was $170,000 of individual, lean, hardcore engagement. It's because the wire harness wasn't meant to be adapted in that way, the power electronics weren't meant to be adapted, and the car wasn't meant to be upgraded for a business model reason. Yeah. And for us, it's different. Um, recycling a Tesla is like recycling a normal car, or maybe in some senses more challenging to fully recycle the battery. Uh, for us, the concept of rapid upgradability is built into the business model. Yeah. And so you can take a printed vehicle, disassemble the parts, put it in a chopper, use that same material to reprint the next version of the next vehicle. It was built as a business model to upgrade the vehicles. Yeah, so it's designed that way. Yeah, I'd be really mad if I found out I spent $170,000 to upgrade something I could have bought brand new for about 65000 but it's probably not the best investment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Char oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Charlie Tyson. Charlie, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I work on a program called Planet M. Uh, Planet M is through the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. We're a state program. Uh, we often act, we're often uh, we simulate as startups, so we're very agile. But what we're focusing on is driving innovation around the movement of people, goods, and services by air, land, and sea. Uh, a big focus of our program is around connected, autonomous, shared, and electric vehicles, trying to ensure that our automotive industry is a, a leader for the next 50 plus years. Um, so we're out here because we see a ton of opportunity to connect uh, startups, innovators to the opportunities we have in Michigan. Uh, whether that's the automotive industry demand, um, what, you know, the pilot and testing opportunities in Michigan, um, the favorable business climate, et cetera. So uh, prior to joining Planet M, um, I found my passion in product development working for a, a local incubator up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is often left off the map. 
but we helped local entrepreneurs take their ideas from napkin to market. Um, had, saw a ton of uh, interesting ideas. Um, I then joined the state of Michigan working on a program called Pure Michigan Business Connect, which helped global corporations build out their supply chain with Michigan-based suppliers, um, and then transitioned into the Planet M program uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, so I'm excited to talk a little bit about what we have going on around you know, connecting global innovation to our industry uh, through matchmaking engagements, um, helping startups come into Michigan and, to, and deploying their technology on roads if it's safe enough, and if not, testing at some of our test beds that are, are uh, world-renowned. So uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Phil, I'm curious. You come from another place, and here you are in Silicon Valley, and I understand you've got a car maker or two that operates out of Michigan. Uh, we do, too. In fact, you, you drive around, you see Toyota Research Labs, I think Mercedes, there's so many facilities in Silicon Valley that could have been perhaps in Michigan, but they chose to be here. Uh, do you see Silicon Valley as a, a partner, a competitor, uh, an ally, a threat? And what's the relationship between Detroit and Palo Alto, so to speak? Yeah, I, we personally see it as a, as a partnership. We're very uh, collaborative in that manner. We don't want to be competitive. We actually want to find, we want to support the innovation happening out here. We want to connect some of the innovation to, again, our industry. So um, sometimes people think that we're, we're trying to be competitive, but we're out here because we want to find partnerships. We want to you know, partner with dif different innovation hubs here and, and uh, learn best practices out here and, and also share what we have going on. Um, so. and, and one follow-up question. I'm not going to blame you for this, because actually uh, the car I have other than the uh, Tesla was actually made in Japan with a Prius. But the day I bought it, the infotainment system was already several years out of date. Mm -hmm. uh, will the industry that's based in your neck of the woods ever figure out how to update in real time the way the tech industry has? We hope so. That, I mean, that's, that's kind of why we're trying to get out and, and uncover new technology. And, and some of these OEM and tier ones are, are actually dedicating a lot of uh, resources to uh, tech scouts or to innovation hubs like out here because they, they want to work with different teams that are more agile and and have um, talent, and, and so I think they're they're starting on a, you know they're starting to get away from being strictly in house and close to the chest, and they're they're trying to work with new companies that can help them um, iterate quicker and and you know hit the road a little bit faster and, and make sure that we are uh, the automotive industry is still a leader um, in in Michigan and, and actually supportive of different regions as well. Good, um, Tim. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I founded Integrated Roadways uh, on the realization that connected electric and autonomous vehicles would require significant upgrades to our core public infrastructure in the same way that when automobiles first hit the market, uh, we had basically gravel roads everywhere. And we had to invest a lot in paving roadways to enable the widespread use of uh, early autos. And we, as a society, we tend to forget that roadways have gone through significant revolutions, uh, not just over the thousands of years of humanity, but over more recent decades. And not only that, roadways are networks. They are humanity's first network. And the next generation of mobility and user devices depend on technology in the public right-of-way. Uh, even today, some of the largest investment areas and some of the most profitable um, private investments are reliant on public infrastructure. Amazon needs it to deliver. Uh, Uber's IPO is poised to be the largest in history, and they wouldn't have a business if they didn't have access to roads. Waymo, Tesla, all of these are totally dependent on roads. So, you know, it seems to me kind of straightforward that we need to upgrade our roadways to accommodate and enable and commercialize these technologies in the same way that we had to upgrade our cable networks for high-speed home internet, we had to upgrade our telephone networks for cellular services, and by tapping into all of these emerging demands and existing demands for data and connectivity and other services in the public right-of-way, we can actually generate enough revenue from the operation of the commercial services to essentially give away the road infrastructure to the public at no impact on your taxes or your tolls. 
Now, I just want to head off one major question that I always get. Isn't that expensive and doesn't it take a long time to build roads? Well, um, road building is really expensive if you look at it as a monolithic cost up front that has to be supported by the public. Uh, but right now, about half of our roads need total reconstruction. And we are about $6 trillion behind uh, as a public in funding those improvements. But does anybody want to pay $6 trillion more in taxes in order to fix our roads? when at the same time all of these emerging and existing businesses are commercializing their access and usage of those roads. Uh, so to me, it makes perfect sense to treat roads like a network and improve them to be a digital network that enables these new markets and then leverage that to actually pay for the necessary improvements. So, Tim, there's one thing that kind of scares me a little bit. You talk about free. Well, Google is free. Facebook is free, but we found out that they aren't really free. They're the cost associated with free. So when anybody tells me they're going to give me something for free, I have to ask, what's the catch? And I'm particularly nervous in your case because you're replacing what has previously been a public infrastructure. I own Highway 101. I don't own it. I don't fully own it, but as a, as a citizen of the United States, I own a piece of that roadway system. I also know that if we need to upgrade Highway 101, if the cement manufacturer or the asphalt manufacturer who whose materials were used to build the road is out of business, that's not going to keep them from going ahead and using other cement or asphalt. I get a little nervous when we talk about private technology, proprietary technology, uh, being used in public roads. Well, that's fair. Um, and I can totally see where your concern comes from. You know, the thing is, though, if we go out of business, there's nobody to defend our patents. So there's nothing to stop anybody from using that technology to begin with. And the best way to keep a business in business is to do business with them. So if we're out there financing the improvement of public roadways, uh, either we continue as a going concern and do well, or we mismanage our funds and we go out of business and anybody can make use of the technology to begin with. Now I do want to say that we are not talking about private ownership of the roadway. Nobody's transferring the real estate uh, it's called a concession where a private investor pays for the improvement to the public asset and then gets a operational contract. In our case, we're not even, uh, you know, we're not trying to control the road in the sense that we're charging you a toll to go on it. The only thing that we're charging for is access to the new and digital services. All right, so your local economy has a major interest in knowing more about traffic and transportation. So your real estate developers, your brick and mortar retail, um, all of the businesses that are, are dependent on that road need the data and they will pay for it, uh, as well as the cell companies need their uh, antennas in the public right of way, they'll pay for that. So, you know, when we talk about giving away the roadway, that's kind of a misnomer. Yeah. We're not actually giving anything away, nor are we taking anything from the public. We're just leveraging the commercial demand in order to finance the okay. improvements. So even though Tim is the only one who comes from an infrastructure company, infrastructure has a huge impact on what everybody on this panel is doing. And as I said during my opening remarks, I worry a lot about this transitional stage we're in now where we have autonomous, semi-autonomous, and completely manually operated vehicles sharing the same roadways, the same infrastructure. So I'm curious to the folks in the panel, what do you think is going to happen over the next three, four, five years as we are in this kind of twain period? Yeah, personally, it's critical that, I think it's critical that our industry collaborates. Um, you know, we don't want to have patch, patchwork regulation. And so I think that's why you're starting to see some of these uh, major automakers come together and, and to work on different standards and, and regulations, um, whether that's level four, level, level five. Um, and, enable, and also what's really even more important, I think, is um, having the industry part, um, collaborate with the, the public sector as well. So um, in, in Michigan, we have a group called the Council, Council for Future Mobility, and that's a group of uh, public and private experts that work on um, regulations and standards and advise the governor and legislators and pol policymakers and NHTSA um, on different regulations and, uh, that they should implement. And, and the goal is to be a leader in this and then uh, really you know, 
matriculate that up to the federal gov government as well, because like you said, like you've been alluding to, we, we can't have um, different uh, technologies and standards um, on the roads. It has to all work together. And um, I think it's really important to see these different major automo automotive companies and the public sector work together. Um, we also, um, I think it's, you know, with the, the US DOT being relatively hands off when it comes to AV standards, I think it, it's up to cities and states to, uh, if they do want to make the invest investment, it's up to them to, uh, again, work on these regulations. But, um, you know, in, in Michigan, we, MDOT has been very, very forward thinking. Uh, they've invested a lot of money in uh, intelligent transportation systems, um, connected corridors, and that allows these different companies to come into Michigan and to test um, as long as the, the, the technology has been uh, validated and is safe to be on the roads. Um, what's, what's also really interesting and what we've seen a big uh, opportunity in is having uh, test beds. So we have two of the leading test beds in Michigan. One's uh, American Center for Mobility. It's a 500 acre um, autonomous and connected vehicle test site, uh, tunnel testing, highway testing, winter testing. Uh, we also have one at the University of Michigan called M-City, more of a suburban environment, uh, 32 acres. Um, but these sites also help ensure that you know, all the different stakeholders are working together, um, are testing in a safe environment. Uh, I think that's these different, you know, efforts are really important. Before we start throwing cars out on the road that are completely autonomous, they need to, you know, be validated um, in a safe environment. Well, and so, I, oh, go ahead real I, quick. I, yeah. I wanted to echo uh, Charlie's comments about open standards. That's actually one of the major obstacles in public infrastructure is the provincialism and the uh, very localized standards for implementing infrastructure, right? Like, if I go to the next town over, my Wi-Fi still works, my 4G still works. But if you are a builder and you go to the next town over, you have to learn an entirely new methodology for you know, that local area. And that's one of the biggest things that holds us back is, is not the lack of op interoperability among private uh, producers, but among the regulatory bodies that set the standards for the community. So Jay, I wanna give you back to my previous question a scenario that happened to me literally two or three hours ago. I'm on Highway 101, and um, Tesla's new autopilot software is automatically deciding it's time for me to merge over to the right lane because I'm getting near an exit, and it starts the merger, and all of a sudden some guy pulls into that lane that I was pulling into, and Tesla very inarticulately kind of aborts the lane change and brings me back into the lane I was in sure. about a split second before I was about to take manual control. That was an unacceptable experience. I mean, I survived it, but it was an unacceptable experience, and it was because that car that was merging into the lane that I was merging into wasn't able to communicate with my car because it had no technology, and my car's technology, all it could do is see it with a camera, which was, which was better than nothing but crude. So that's what I'm getting at. When, what is it gonna take to, to feel that I could have literally taken the word autopilot and used it the way I would if I were flying an airplane with autopilot, Right. Pretty much relax and maybe go, go to, you know, I, I I'm actually am a pilot, not active, but on autopilot, the pilot can actually get up and go to the bathroom and, you know, the plane will continue to fly itself sure. safely. Yeah. You know. I mean, these are difficult questions. I, th usually the way that I support it, when I started my company, I was deployed in Iraq and two of my friends were killed that year while we were on deployment. One was killed in a meeting ambush where his vehicle was shot with a uh, um, uh, basically a rocket propelled grenade and the vehicle that he was in was not safe for fighting combat operations in. But he was killed and he won a Navy Cross for doing it. He was my partner at Scout Sniper School. And the other one was my first operations officer. He was killed in a CH-46 Chinook, which was developed in Vietnam. It was shot down, it flipped over in a lake, and he drowned inside it. And then I decided that the technology that we work in in vehicles was simply not acceptable for war fighting, nor is it acceptable for the way in which we get around. So I, this is a little bit of a zig to the question. Yeah. The answer, I think, comes to the same place. The question is, how are we safe? Um, Charlie, you made a statement about like they shouldn't be deployed until they're safe. Does anybody know how many people die due to human engendered accidents every hour in the United States? Guesses, anyone. Die, killed, brutal deaths every hour in the United States. Guesses, five and a half. Every day, it's 110 people. Auto accidents or all accidents? 
auto accidents, auto, yeah. due to human engendered accidents mm -hmm. that are auto accidents. Right. That is unacceptably unsafe. I can't say it enough. Mm -hmm. Five mothers and fathers lose their kids never to come back and we sit around and opine about what is safe and what is not. It's criminal when the technology is there yeah. that we don't get out and make a difference. Tesla's autopilot would be better if it was allowed to actually deploy the technology. If politicians said, in my city, which I'm the mayor of, you're not gonna drive your human car because I'm gonna make this for a week, a day, all autonomous, you could show the potential of what's out there. We could be so much more bold as a nation, as mayors, as states. To, the technology is there. Infrastructure is a big part yeah. of it. So there are great infrastructure pieces. Mm -hmm. We drive in our vehicles 50 miles an hour toward an intersection when there is good infrastructure there, and it knows around a corner where the vehicle really can't possibly communicate with anything other than another smart vehicle around the corner, whether it's safe to blow through what used to be called a stoplight. And so, and it works beautifully. And it is much safer than what we currently have with somebody texting and driving on the other end of the road. But I have been in conversations listening to trial lawyers that say, Madam Senator, you should not allow these vehicles on the road until they prove themselves to be 100% right. safe. Unrealistic. Pardon me? It's unrealistic. It is entirely yeah. we don't, unrealistic. We don't hold humans to the, anywhere so near the standard. Engineers yeah. and business model builders need to rage against the machine in order <laughs> to be able to make that happen. And so, I mean, it, actually, that's, rage that's in like, favor of the machine. Yeah, rage yeah. in favor of the machine. Yeah. So, I, I mean, and then it, just one comment on regulation is that I am a believer in what you both said, which is patchworks of regulations are really difficult to do business in. Yet, on the other hand, I just want to provide a counterpoint because I can't decide which side I come down on. It is really a, a, a restorative part to the traditional industry to say we need a common regulation in order to be able to move forward. There are many businesses who would like to start a small business to test things and are held back by a push by the USDOT in order to be, quote, hands off until there is a common regulation. And I, it, it deserves a lot more thinking. Mm -hmm. I, it's just not a simple answer to me. I appreciate doing business in a common regulatory environment and benefit from it. And yet I also, IEEE standards, it's a great way to do business. USB, we couldn't even communicate if we didn't have it. Right. On the other hand, when the federal government won't make a statement and we say, well, great, then we just don't have to do anything until we, until we have a common regulation or we're gonna study it and study it and study it, there is already a patchwork. It's called Romania. It's called Estonia. It's called Russia. It's called China. It's called Singapore. This is the world we live in. Right. It, it sounds like you should support a ticket of Bernie Sanders and Bill Weld because it seems like you're part libertarian and part socialist. And I'm, I'm sorry, you're probably neither. And capitalist. I don't know. Capitalist. I would support them all. Yeah. I just but, want to see but you know, it's us funny, not but the, die on the roadways. And I, I mentioned I used to be a pilot, and I was a pilot who didn't have a lot of money, so I had an airplane that didn't have a transponder, which meant I couldn't fly into certain airports sure. because I didn't have the technology. Now, 50 years ago, I could have flown in any airport with that airplane, but in, in modern times, the, the FAA has said, no, you need yeah. to have this piece of technology before we will let you in this airport. You want to go fly out in the countryside, you know, have, go have it. Larry, if I could add to that, uh, I think a big part of uh, the challenge that the both of you are describing is the lack of supporting infrastructure. Because if we had smart infrastructure that could automatically identify where all of the vehicles were in relation to one another, it wouldn't matter if you're driving a brand new local motors vehicle, well, letting it drive you, or a Tesla, or a Toyota from the 80s, right? We need that layer of public infrastructure to be able to communicate with vehicles and locate vehicles that don't communicate in order to warn the ones that do. There's a car broken down here, there's another one you know, coming up in this lane, and have that history to it that your onboard system with just a camera, it doesn't know where a vehicle has been and where it's going, it only knows where it is moment to moment. So without this layer of mediating infrastructure to identify vehicle positions and communicate them, we're going to have these massive safety risks that will continue for decades. And to go back to your question about the commingling of the vehicles, the average vehicle is 12 years old. So even if we had a fully autonomous vehicle hit the market right now, we've got at least a decade of commingling before that changes. Yeah. And, and aviation has kind of solved that problem. I mean, you can fly, uh, an 80-year-old Cessna 
you can't fly it necessarily in exactly the same airspace, but they, and, and the FAA will know where you are. Mm -hmm. They can still track you even though you're an 80 year old airplane with very li little avionics. Right. So, um, yeah, did you want to? I was just going to say that's it was an incredible point, Jay. I mean, I don't know how down the line when there's fully autonomous vehicles, how that's going to work with people that have, you know, traditional vehicles. I don't know, but we need to start implementing technology that is able to be out on the roads today, whether that's vehicle to infrastructure technology, equipping uh, roadside units um, to be able to let, you know, detect uh, accidents before they happen and, you know, letting the driver know um, that there might be an accident um, approaching. So some of these things that can be implemented right now is what we're trying to do in, in Michigan and, and we're seeing different cities. Um, so I, that was a good point. So I, I heard the head of Toyota Research speak at CES a couple of years ago, I can't remember his name, and he made the point that the problem with driver-assisted technology is that it lulls us into a sense of false security and that you can actually get a little too lazy. Now, if we had a perfect autonomous vehicle system where they literally drove themselves, it wouldn't be an issue. We'd all be sleeping in the back seat. But to the point where, you know, you get a little lazy. I mean, how do we solve the human problem during this time between now and when it's all automated? I don't know that we let one person solve it. I think that it's a you know a business infrastructure to solve it. There are solutions, 12-year-old cars right around that border, nine-year-old cars. You really don't have a lot of electric infrastructure in the vehicle in order to be able to make too many changes to the vehicle without a human input or without another kind of hydraulic input. And so, I mean, the bottom line is businesses are built on those things. We need to keep up with it from a safety perspective. And I think we all need to have a bigger perspective. Insurance needs to be in this debate. Yes. Um, because when somebody gets in a vehicle that isn't owned by a person, there is no uh, normal insurance involved. And we have this expectation that we can use our public right of way for things that are um, going to have a recourse. And so I think that all of those businesses come along to make this a society that we can accept living in. And, uh, um, and it's a great time to be doing this. It really is. I mean, people believe we needed Tesla to come along to make electric cars a thing. Yeah. We needed Uber and Lyft to come along to make ride sharing a thing. And, and on top of those things, you can build many great things. And, you know, I really hope if you all can get the roadways out, people will see the, the benefit of when you do. People will see the benefit of using that. And, you know, that's how you become competitive in business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to open it up to comments and questions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Do Why don't you know? introduce yourself, please? Global, global community building. You know, I'm better without a mic. So, can you shed some light if today's topic was transformative hardware plus transformative community? Right. How much would the change be accelerated? If you can engage, so ignore the world when you make your product, and the world will ignore your product. <laughs> I believe in that so much. And so, when we started our business, knowing we were going to print vehicles at a rapid pace, we said we need to engage a global community of people. So we started LaunchForth, which now has community members in almost every country in the world. And we give them an opportunity to contribute to the design and development of vehicles and systems on vehicles. That starts a conversation which only the internet could have allowed. I had the luxury of sitting next to Tim Berners-Lee several years ago behind stage before we went out on stage. And he even knew it. He said, you know, the first time I wrote the po protocol for being able to move pictures and sounds around, the, uh, around a net to make it more usable, um, he knew that hardware would follow along at some point. But not giving global community of people the access to use the internet to make our hardware better, I mean, that's the reason why we're all here today. I mean, hardware con is not hardware con, it's, it is people con in some senses. Connected by the internet, hardware can get better. So we started LaunchForth for that reason. We run, we've given away a million and a half dollars in prizes, we pay royalties for all of our community members that help design vehicles, and they come from all over the world. And so I do believe you're right, that they are part of it. But the community is not just designers and engineers, the community is regulators and fire safety folks and people who uh, are in government and other things like that. So a, a more global conversation, well organized and moderated, can transform mobility faster. Uh, I, any other questions, comments? Yes, sir. So until we get to this uh, fully automated world, right, meaning in the next 10 years or whatever, seven years, what we are doing is we are adding more and more distractions into the car. 
you know, I can go order some, you know, dog food on Amazon, you know, Alexa, right? So where do you see that future, meaning will it get worse before it gets, you know, better, you know, and what should car companies or individuals or hardware companies do that will make driving a lot more safer, you know, texting and driving and so many other things that happen. I'll start with that. So um, I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about. Um, and I, it's a good question. I think that um, initially, near term, you're gonna, it's, you're gonna see mobility as micro modal. Um, you're gonna see you know, autonomous shuttles in a, in a you know, geo-fenced region um, taking people around. You're gonna see, um, you're seeing right now electric scooters downtown in the cities. Um, but down the line, um, you know, I've heard that as well. We could be holding meetings in, in vehicles, in, in shuttles. Um, how that is gonna play out, um, it's, it's something that we're all speculating about. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of, uh, could you elaborate on specifically what you were looking for there? Very really short amount of time, by the way. What's the responsibility of the cars and actually the cell phone manufacturers and things like that? where they could cut down on these distractions. And you know, what is the role of regulation in this area? You know, those kinds of things. From a regulation standpoint, not sure from a, a technology standpoint, we're starting to see a lot of these automotive suppliers um, implement like driver distracting, distractive avoidance technology. So like sensors in the vehicle to, um, that can analyze people's eyes to see if they're not paying attention to the vehicle. Um, so that's, that's some of the things right now that we're getting um, requests from, you know, tier ones, uh, you know, they'll come to us and say, do you have any startups in your network that are doing this type of technology? Um, so definitely in vehicle sensors are going to become really, really important. Um, so that's just something that I've been seeing lately. And, and I, a quick comment, which is that I think you're absolutely right. It's getting better and it's getting worse. So the good news about Tesla is autopilot. The bad news is that you actually have to use the screen to turn on the windshield wipers, which means hand-eye coordination, taking your eyes off the road. I don't think that's a step in the right direction. So I think that manufacturers really need to think, as long as the human is sitting in that seat, driving that car, they need to put more thought into how they can avoid having the human take his, his or her attention off the road. Well, one more response to that, and then we have to actually get the hook. Anybody else want to respond to that well, question? I just want to say that move fast and break things doesn't work when you have people inside. Yeah. So we need more courage from our beloved uh, public administrators uh, we also need more responsibility from the, not just the technology providers, uh, but also the drivers. You know, in most states it is illegal to drive distracted, but that's not where the enforcement is. We see enforcement on speeding, which frankly at this point is not really the primary motivator of fatalities. Hmm. So, you know, it's all about just reorganizing what we're focused on to address the largest pro problem that we're facing. Well, I, that's going to have to be the last word. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Thank panel. You, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Appreciate it. Excellent presentation.